Hello everyone and welcome to the first event in our month-long Mind Your Mind campaign focused on chef mental health. This is a Chef Network webinar in partnership with BWG Food Service. Today's event, a conversation on mental health struggles with JP McMahon and Patrick Powell will begin shortly. JP is owner and chef at Eat Galway and Patrick is chef of Allegra restaurant in London. Thank you for joining us for the session today, which will last approximately one hour. All attendees will be automatically muted throughout the session. We will have time for questions at the end of the session, and there are two ways to submit a question for answering. If at any time during the session, you would like to submit a question, this can be done via the questions function in your toolbar, which will then be asked during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can raise your hand using the raise your hand tool during the Q&A session to request to ask a live question over your microphone. Both myself, Rebecca, and my colleague, Ruth Hegarty from Chef Network, will be in the background assisting our speakers this morning. I will now pass you over to Ricky O'Brien from our partners, BWG Food Service, for a quick welcome message. Thank you, Rebecca, and good morning all, and thanks for logging in this morning. Just briefly on behalf of me and all my colleagues at BWG Food Service, I want to say how delighted we are to partner with Chef's Network on this very important topic and for the whole month of January in Mind Your Mind Month. Um, today's topic is about mental health struggles. Um, when I read JP's blog on this, I thought it was really honest and heartfelt, and it really struck a chord with me. So if you haven't read it, I would advise reading it. It's a, it's a great blog. And it's great that we are talking about this. So look, I'm really looking forward to listening to JP and Patrick Powell. I want to thank them first for their bravery and leadership in talking about their experiences with this struggle. And um, I wish them luck in today's blog. So look, thank you, gentlemen. Over to you. Hi, JP. Hey, Patrick. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I was good. 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 How is how is London faring? The weather, how's the weather anyway? It's good, it's cold. We haven't had snow here yet, but it's uh, it's been very, very cold. Um, not much rain, which has been nice, but it's very quiet. I've, I've never seen London this quiet before. Yeah, it, is, uh, it must be strange, particularly London. I mean, Galway, at least Galway in January is uh, it's probably the quietest month of the year. So it's uh, it's not so noticeable. I think on the weekends it will, but I'd say London is like a, like a ghost town um, at the moment. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I guess through all kind of lockdowns, you start to London starts to feel very small for such a big, vast place. It starts to feel really, really small. Um, and uh, how is um how is this time around for you as opposed to the last two times in terms of I don't know energy and uh, um, and motivation? I think since we've gone into full lockdown on on monday or it's a tuesday morning for the country um a lot more accepting of it because you feel like it's been done for a reason when they've been turning on and off hospitality like a tap in in previous lockdowns as they did in november or when we got closed down just after being open for two weeks in december that was very difficult to, to stomach because you can't see the, the rhyme or reason behind it it just doesn't make any sense. You're like, you know, this is not going to make a difference, but the government has just done it because hospitality is probably the easiest uh, one to turn on and off and the easiest way to make, look, to make it look like you're doing something. Um, despite all the effort restaurants have gone through to become safe places. Um, but now that the country is in full lockdown and there is a vaccine and, you know, there's a potential kind of end date in sight it makes it a lot easier to to stomach and you can kind of get on board with it um so i, I guess there's a, a certain sense of positivity uh with that and to be able to open up in the spring again when there's nice produce around and we've lost the seats outside so you know we'll get to, hopefully get to see the restaurant in its prime come this summer um so i i, I feel a bit better now than i did in November or on the first lockdown when there was that sense of uncertainty and unknown about it. Um, how, yeah, how... I think I think definitely from Go on. Yeah, I think definitely for me as well in terms of the 
I feel I feel much less um, anxious, or I'm not anxious. The wrong word, probably. I mean, I think the last few times there was a, a certain uncertainty and 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 kind of the energy or anxiety levels. Whereas this time, I'm almost I, I'm like resigned, but not in not in a negative way. In a kind of like, look, it is the way it is, and we can't we can't do anything at the moment. So we're um, we're we're just going to try and wait and and uh, and see how we. Um, I just take a bit of time to try and uh, see to 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 restart to reformulate a few things about the restaurants, you know. And it's very rare you get a time like this as well. So we're trying to take the positives in that, and like we we haven't even done takeaway in Tartar this time around because I, I suppose I feel guilty as well. I just don't want to bring more people out onto the street yeah. for for a cup of coffee and a sandwich and like i think i think everyone who can because i i do think that if we just do this for 10 or 12 weeks then we can we can just get back open and i think the more places that kind of uh delude themselves or 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 even the more industries i i think it's just time now where i just think every industry for the sake of 12 weeks just needs to stay look it's only 12 weeks i mean if we can if we can weather 12 weeks i'm sure bigger restaurants or bigger companies are are back and um uh can, can do that but but certainly i think the last in the last lockdown the second one was probably the hardest in terms of the mental health and i think that's because we were just closed so suddenly and yeah. um like i thought the summer was good it was great to be reopened we were doing stuff again and, and then it, it just came uh as i think as a blow and I, I think that the fact that it was into november as well and it was dark i think it was for me, definitely the second lockdown was was the hardest in terms of um, mental health, and I, I did find myself struggling. And, and it's hard with that when you're in the house and the, you're with, you're with the kids and you're trying to find things to do. And I think that's the nature of of being a chef as well. That you're, uh, I suppose, you're always moving, you know. And yeah. then all of a sudden, you stop moving. And um, I suppose that um, that that kind of like that kind of feeling at the um, I suppose it reminds me of of um, of your talk at, at at Food in the Edge when you you were you were talking about I suppose having to wait for Allegra to be open and being at a at um, I suppose a, a a certain a certain kind of uh, looseness around what, what you were trying to do and do you want do you want to talk a talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think there's um, I think as as you said that people as well but you, you can't sit still and you're kind of very um very used to a certain way of working and, and living and you know as, as, as hard as that might be you still kind of love it and when that's taken away it's quite difficult to um to, to manage your time i guess and i i know from experience be it waiting for allegra to open or um through the lockdown said I'm, I'm not someone who's going to take up gardening or 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 whatever hobby might be i'm just i'm just not that person i like working i like not just cooking but any aspect of running a restaurant that's what i like to do and that's you know that's that's my job but it's also my hobby and when that's kind of taken away from you it's, it's it's quite it's quite difficult and i think for me i struggle most in in the summer granted there was times where it was a lot of fun the first um I think once furlough had been announced, that uncertainty was gone away about, you know, how how am I, along with everyone else, going to put a keep a roof over their head? But um, I think once that was kind of announced, we were like, actually, this is okay. It's it's really hot outside. Um, all my mates are off. There was we just like we um, spent a lot of time in the park drinking, which was which was lovely. But that went away very quickly as well after a few weeks. That kind of anxiety came back, and they like actually there's no end game in sight here my career is ticking away I'm not getting any younger what is going to happen with this and then that has kind of got a bit tougher and tougher and i think this lockdown feels a little bit easier as well because it's it's dark earlier and there's there's kind of a sense of acceptance with it being dark you're like okay it's it's five or six o'clock i've done everything for the day it's okay just to sit and watch tv or read a book or whatever it might be as opposed to the first lockdown when it's very sunny outside at eight o'clock and you're like i don't know what to do with myself does i've done all the things i can do it's eight o'clock it's still bright i don't know what to do and i don't know how long this is going to be going on for and i, I find that very challenging yeah I, I think definitely when you say that the evenings i find 
it's but i think it's because like maybe you're just you're pre-programmed for service and and the energy levels start to move up and i find like during the day it's not too bad because generally i'd be doing restaurant stuff like like admin but then when when you when you get to five or six it's always like oh my god there's another like six hours of the day and what am i going to do and it, it, it is like it is some some days are easy and i don't know what 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 lines up where like you something on or you read or uh but it, but it does it does, i think it does take its toll sometimes as well and particularly when you're when you uh like when you have a, a lot of internal dialogue going on all day sometimes by the end of it you're going god i'm just really tired now and um like yeah. i find i find the most difficult thing is is uh is 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 for me is trying not to um uh trying not to drink every night and i'm not saying like i drink excessively but it's still like it's still i know i know how like how alcohol affects me and like i'm only talking about it like a glass of wine or two or um but it's still when it when it becomes like just like a ritual where that's all i'm waiting for it's like okay it's six or seven o'clock i can sit down and i can have a glass of wine now it's kind of like i, I it's hard to not want your days you want you want something else to do you know and it's um i think that's why for me that the kitchen the energy in the in the kitchen the energy of service is something I always it's almost like the day was beginning at five or six and then like you got to the the end of your day was midnight and then you go and that but everyone was asleep then you know so it's it is certainly something that uh that it, it's hard to it's hard to replace you know and no amount of no amount of walks as much as i love them will uh will add up to uh will add up to that social dynamic and and the service and the customers and um and it, it's strange the, the longer it go, you know, the longer you go without it the more i i feel god what if this never came back and of course it will but it's just it is this this scary um situation where you're just wondering god like what if this went on for another nine months and we had no restaurants and yeah so it is um I think it's really challenged us in terms of how we think about ourselves because we are so used to just, I suppose, being so certain of knowing what we're doing. And maybe past generations yeah. didn't, have that, didn't have that certainty. Like, I mean, past generations had different epidemics or different, um, different diseases, even like polio. I had two uncles and like stuff that like challenged your body. And I think we, we got into, a, um, I suppose, 10 or 20 or 30 years where nothing everything just seemed like plain sailing it was like god this is going to be we're just going to be grand and i think it has stopped us in our tracks and, and made us think about like the the purpose of, of what we're doing yeah big time I'm, I'm on the during the first lockdown my uh my partner saying to me was like well why don't you just like find something to do to fill your days and just kind of she got a dirty look and it was like there's, there's nothing that can fill 16 hours or 15 hours like you might be doing a chef in day yeah, I can go for a walk, I can read, but nothing is going to fill up all that time. And uh, I think that that's the that's that's the tricky one. But I think this time around, it's, it's an acceptance of that it's okay to not do anything. Um, yeah, has, has has helped me a lot. And one thing that I found quite dangerous on the first and second lockdown was social media and looking at what other people were doing, and then feeling like you should be doing something and I know social media is um, a tool for some people to, you know, as it's 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 an outlet. Um, so be it doing uh, cooking demos at home or going out for runs or whatever, you know, you know, you're kind of showing everyone that you're you're doing something, and it's helpful. It might be helpful for yourself, but I think that can also cause problems for other people. And it's the same as looking at what other restaurants are doing, and that used to cause me a lot of anxiety. Um, because I was like, am I doing enough? Am I doing the right thing? We need to do something. Why are we doing something? And I'd be messaging the restaurant manager, like, we need to do something. And he's like, you said yes, say that we shouldn't do anything. I was like, yeah, but social media. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I think this time around, I've been ignoring social media a lot. But plus, I think a lot of people, maybe they're going through the same thing where they don't feel the need to express what they're up to on social media. Um, it just seems to be a lot quieter than before. But yeah. That, yeah. Social media for me was one that was kind of putting me up and down on the first lockdown, I guess, because just constantly looking at what what other people are doing as opposed to worrying about myself and uh, the restaurants. Yeah, it's definitely it does, it does definitely cause you to 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 question um, 
like I think definitely around like I suppose even even the fact that and we were talking just before we came on about like after, during the first lockdown we had a great time doing takeaway and a box scheme which both lost money and we like we that's why we didn't do it in the second and we're not doing it now but there was a certain for me looking at particularly what happens in Dublin because Galway is a lot smaller again but like the it was there was seemed to be a, a greater energy in Dublin in terms of doing boxes and I was like why aren't we doing these beautiful boxes and and when I, even when I look at like say the likes of Lyles or that some of the boxes are just so fantastic and I was saying like God we're really doing nothing like we really should be doing trying to do more but the problem is you start just to produce more and more and you have more and more branding more and more like an ear turned into a warehouse in the first lockdown and it was just full of takeaway boxes and and stickers and different labels and like it looks fantastic but we were doing probably 45 or 50 people a day um uh, uh for the three places and it just it nearly took all the staff to do that and in the end i the second time around myself and 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 Drigine just said god look we need to just take a break and this is not doing anything it's not bringing in any money i think the second time around with when the grant scheme came in uh like it was actually more profitable just to just to do nothing for the restaurant yeah. we got it we got a grant and just like rather than uh, than trying to do it, so it it, it is it, it is difficult to, to 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 stay away from that. And um, uh, I do I find social media like it's it's the it's the the best and the worst things sometimes of every day, just because you find some great 100%. nugget. Yeah, you find great things, and you you outside your area, and then sometimes you just get dragged back into God. Like, why? That's a great dish. How come we didn't do something today, or something like that? So. Uh, yeah it is um it's, it, it is you're right it is the the best and the worst um it can uh it can inspire you but also it can kind of put that that unfair pressure that and i, I think it's like it's, it's the same for everyone i guess it's the same in all aspects of life it's the same every january where everyone's like you know go join the gym or do this workout or go on this diet and this, that that pressure and i think when you're when you're set at home and there's nothing to go, nowhere to go or nothing to do, it uh, I think it's, it's quite am amplified. Um, you touched on the the drinking uh, earlier, which um, again is another, I guess, a dangerous one for chefs when you when you find yourself quite idle. Um, and I felt like the over the summer there was a lot of, I guess, very social drinking. Um, yeah. and then. I think in the November one as well, I found myself going quite hard. Um, I think because the November one, they were like, oh, we'll be back open in December. So I didn't take it serious as a lockdown because it was just hospitality. So, you know, it's kind of like a go fuck yourself to the government. You know, why is it, why is it just um, uh, yeah. hospitality that has to suffer? Plus, I think because there was a time frame on it, you're like, all right, well, you know, I may as well just enjoy this month. Um, but then again, the, the the hangovers when you're stuck at home do not suit me at all. They're like they're, they're, they can become very very dangerous hangovers where um, you know alcohol being the depressant that it is and things being bad enough already, it just doesn't help the situation. And I think this time around, bar maybe one or two nights over Christmas, um, we've been doing next to no drinking, um, which is which is felt much much better and getting up earlier in the morning and having you know having breakfast which is which i think helps so much it's, it's getting up by not sitting in bed till 10 or 11 but you're getting up at eight or nine and you're you're eating something straight away and i think that that helps a lot um it's a lot better than uh, having a hangover <laughs> yeah no i i completely agree with you and i, I think the I, I sometimes my only i think my only saving grace as a as a as a, as a as a chef and drinking was that I hated hangovers and uh, that was my <laughs> only saving grace. I honestly because I th I think it was so it was so uh, endemic in the industry. I suppose when I went into it in in the late nineties and it was almost like just uh, like something you did after work. You just and if you didn't do it, it was kind of like you didn't feel like you were part of the team or part of. So definitely, um, I I find that. The being hung over and 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 then trying to actually do things the next day and then and then and then chat and then actually just doubting yourself and and um and all of those kind of negative thoughts do do come in so i, I find again it's uh 
it's it's something that, you, that I think chefs have to have to be have to be aware of. And um, I think because we're surrounded with it, because most restaurants serve alcohol, so it's like yeah. if, if if it's not if even if um uh, um. I even if we just wanted to go down and have have a drink, it's like the restaurants are there. You know, it's like it's all, I'd say it's almost similar to people who grow up in bars. It's just it's around you all the time, and and when you meet other people that um that are not in the industry, then you realize how much you're surrounded by it. And as you said, I think that the fact that it is a depressant, I think we have to be be careful. And I do think trying to um at like this time around i've been trying to do more time on the headspace app just a little bit of mindfulness and and it's not and it's probably because i have more time and i probably didn't really want to be silent or or to take time kind of thinking about myself and that so this time around trying to do that every day and um and as you said trying to get up in the morning to uh early because then you actually feel like you're you're uh you're 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 kind of participating, or you're or you're doing something, you know. Yeah, yeah. And something um, uh, Connor, our, our restaurant manager, who's who's also Irish, um, we we start kind of we're going into work twice a week, um, just on on Mondays and Wednesdays, and just for like three or four hours, just to work on reopening the restaurant. But we want we kind of want to see it as a almost a, a relaunch or or a new opening again and go back into it with a sense of uh, new enthusiasm and, and freshness whenever that time does come about because well, one of the reasons is we, we both love it and like working but it's it's uh, it's to have a routine as well that we're kind of and we have we're, we've kind of set it to certain days and it has to be these days and it has to be these times it's not like oh can we do it later because i was out last night or whatever we're not out last night we can't go out <laughs> i was drinking last night um <laughs> um but just to keep a, a sense of um routine in in our lives that and that we're that we're working towards something and we'll just you know reforecast go through figures again and one, one day we just kind of do the financial side of things and then the other day is more from a creative side and you know going month by month a solid business plan of how we're going to build our team back up again and put the structure back into the restaurant make it feel exciting again because we kind of you know, we we kind of got a bit stitched up with our, our opening. We're only open for a few months. We just started to pick up some traction, and it was starting to close down. And it's open, close, open, close. So we kind of missed that sense of excitement that can come with a new opening. Um, and as well, I think the one thing we found with the lockdowns is that it was really bad for for staff morale having to go through um, the the lockdown process again. You know, the first time particularly that. The sense of uncertainty in it and we essentially we made all our staff redundant because furlough hadn't been announced yet and our, our goal was right let's make sure everyone leaves with as much money as we can give them as a business so paid everyone out holidays and redundancies so or we're going to and then furlough was announced which is great but in the meantime we had gone through that redundancy process with all our staff which yeah. is quite horrible for, for for them and and us and then you know we reopened and there was a sense of excitement and you know it was going into summer and we we done quite well for uh in that period um we'd heavily reduced our overheads which which helped but we were, we were ticking over quite well as a restaurant all things considered and then you had the restrictions coming in and the, the sense of uncertainty around them and that what that brings more stress and anxiety to uh to us and all the staff and then we did november one and then december one by the time december one came around staff were just pissed off as as I was myself, but it's not so much stretching as your workplace, but it's hospitality and it's London and it's life and it's the world. So we kind of want to, any negativity that might have crept into the place because of that, we need to figure out how to get rid of it and make people love working in hospitality again, as opposed to resenting it because of the stress it's put on all our lives um, over the past year or whatever. Um, and another issue that comes with it is that because there's less people around, there's less customers, uh, we, we've less staff. We've had to have our, our staffing. So that means people are working. When we were open, people were working harder than ever. And so we're kind of back in the same hole we were in 10 years ago in terms of hospitality that um, chefs are doing too many hours again. You know, we'd, we'd work quite hard to get those hours down and, you know, get a good work-life balance, make things pleasant. I think ultimately chefs will always do have to work more hours in other industries it's just kind of unless people want to pay double what they pay for their food that's just how it's going to be 
Um, but I think now it's going to be very, very hard to bring back that work-life balance and get people working reasonable hours. Um, and that's kind of what, what Connor and I are just kind of really working on at the moment is that for how long is this going to be bad and when can we show staff that there will be light at the end of this tunnel and that, you know, come uh, May will be this busy, come June will be that busy so we can employ more staff and we can kind of balance out the hours. Um, so that's keeping us busy. Yeah, no, def I think the staffing issue is going gonna, is gonna to be hard because... Um, Again, just with the open close, open close. I think every lockdown, the, this is the third one. We probably lost three or four staff. Like some we lost mm -hmm. to other areas. Some just uh, unfortunately just took jobs in more secure areas, and and others went home. Or particularly the first lockdown, we had a lot of um, so a lot of our European staff just went home and they didn't come back. And um, so like I am worried that this time around, like we have no staff for a year because we haven't opened in a year, so we have zero staff. Um. We have already lost a few in Cava, and so I think as well that I am concerned that, like we we had got Cava because Cava is a very busy restaurant. We had got we had got it down to everyone was working four days and had three days off, uh, whereas in Tartar it was five and two because it, it it's not as busy. But like when it's it's when you're when you're back into doing five um, days, uh, it's it's uh, or even six in some cases. Like you, you, you don't want that. And I think it's trying to, it's, it's trying to balance out reopening and then also trying to get the staff to to buy into. It's going to be, it's going to be hard. And I like, I, it's, yeah. it's not that I think um, this generation is any, um, I suppose the the work ethic is is any different. But I just think there's more. I don't know. Maybe there's more things outside people's. Um, in, in people's lives, you know, and I found that even though, as you said, like, I don't think people are ever going to pay double. Like, I find now we need more chefs to do the same amount of people. In the past, we in say 10 or 15 years ago, we probably would have done it with half as many chefs. And I, I don't know what has changed. Like, in, of course, it's, it's it's certainly a positive thing. But in, in terms of uh, when you put on your restaurant tour hat, it is diff difficult to balance because you can't just keep adding up putting more and more um, price, uh, money onto the onto onto your dishes but at the same time you need more staff because you want you want to have a greater work life balance so it is something that i think that um it's, it's not it's certainly not resolved and it's um it's an ongoing thing and it's it is something that i i, I definitely want to see the younger chefs happy and uh, cooking and then making sure they have um they have time to do whatever they want to do but at the same time um, I think it's important that we, as you said, like I think chefs are always going to have to work hard, and I think that it's it's part and parcel of the of the industry. And I think then, but then sometimes I think our industry is is some, is, is looked upon in, in some sort of way that it's unlike other industries. And I think that if you're working as a solicitor or accountant, I think often uh, you work just as hard and just as many hours. Yeah. And I think maybe it's just that the media just don't see this and. They focus on oh god, these young chefs are doing 14, 16 hour days, and like I, I know young solicitors that are doing like that, and um for a for a fixed salary, and there's you you, you can't even question it. Maybe because of the the structures that are in in law, that it's just accepted, you know, and it's like you work through this and you get to a better place. Yeah, no, it is. I, I've had that conversation lots of times with, with other chef friends where it's. You know, it's it's not just hospitality where it's pe people are working these many hours, and I think sometimes there is a negative light uh, put on hospitality. And, and I mean, I'm just it's slightly controversial, but I, I think in the past, previous all this happened. I think in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of different um, forums and groups really jumping on kitchens and chefs and how kitchens are run. And I know there's lots of bad things in kitchens. But there's lots of good things as well. It does frustrate me a lot where you've got these, a lot of people are shaming kitchens and chefs for how hard they're working or how, how hard they're working their staff. And, you know, it's, it's not the full story. You know, there's, there wouldn't be restaurants if people worked 40 hours a week. It just wouldn't be, there wouldn't be viable businesses. Um, and, I, you know, I often think that the full picture is not there and people do not appreciate um how much money they really should be spending on food and how expensive a restaurant is to run. That does uh, frustrate me a lot.
No, I, I think so, and I think that like, you, well, we all, I always seem to go back to 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 to, con, to comparing it with with, with uh, other stuff, and when you have, um, uh, I think the challenges that you have, and if you have stages working with you in that, and how these things are portrayed in the media, sometimes I do think it is it is quite depressing because it's um, it's uh, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of love and nurturing as far as I'm concerned, and I'd never I'd never make someone do something just to get an end result. Sometimes I feel that other industries is just it's an end result. I mean, particularly I've got friends in publishing, and it's just if if there's a deadline for a book, everyone works, and it's like yeah. you can't even question the system. But like it's, I, I think sometimes that we need a bit more focus on look that um I think this is happening everywhere in the Western world because of the economic way we have it, and it's nothing it's nothing particular to to kitchens. It's just it's the way the world works, and unfortunately things are are cheaper because we want them to be cheaper therefore people people work more you know um and i um i think that is that is is something that um that that it's something that i constantly want to change because i think at the end of the day i think that uh when you were like i suppose i'm only mid 40s but when you think about legacy I, I think one of the legacies that i want to try and instill is that people are happier in kitchens i think that's all i mean it's one of the one of the challenges and certainly I mean, when I was um, like a, a teenager in kitchens, like I was afraid, you know, and it was like this big angry head chef and you just did what you did. And I, I just like it to be nicer. I still, of course, you have to have this really strong work ethic and you want things to be correct and be precise. But I don't think that that has to, that you have to go down that route shouting and roaring. And I, I think that you can have a, a really great day in a great kitchen and and have a, a lot of positivity come from it and i think that's for me i was we were just talking about this uh, saying um particularly in the near and it's because it's a mission star restaurant and the standards are really high like i said oh, one of the few differences we can make is to make this a really a really beautiful place to work and and yeah. to, for people the staff to come in and go god i love this place because i like i know how hard it is to work at that level and particularly as you go up the chain and it's it just turns into a machine and i was like i don't want i wouldn't trade that for more awards i was like we have to have a nice a nice day and cook and make everything nice and if we can do that hopefully we'll be able to influence other kitchens when go wow god there's no one shouting like we have a no shouting policy across the board in any of our in in the three restaurants and and it does, it does, it does change the the younger chefs and the sous chefs, and I think hopefully it will change the in it, it will change the industry. Yeah, I, I think um, young chefs now are a lot, um, a lot, they're a lot better educated in in terms of in terms of food uh, massively. They they know a lot more than even I, I find myself having to, to keep reading to keep up with the the guys and you know because they're, they're i guess they're so enthusiastic and they have a lot more knowledge as well uh, at their fingertips with with the internet which you know I, I guess if if i go back to when i was in my uh late teens early 20s you were very much reliant on a book that you probably couldn't afford so you borrow someone else's book or you'd go into a bookshop and write down a recipe from it and, or you pass you on that recipe and that, that recipe was saving where or someone might show you a technique that there's no other way you could have learned it aside from working somewhere. Now they can just learn how to do it online. They can just learn how to make bread on YouTube or whatever it might be, or they can read a, a very well informed and book on, on fermentation or making kojis or whatever it might be. So I think chefs know a lot more now, not just in terms of food, but also in how they should be treated. And I, I know like in, in in the team I have, which is quite quite a small team now, if I turned around and shouted at them during service or was out of line, they'd tell me to go fuck myself. They really would. Like, yeah. they, and that's, that's the culture that we've kind of have as well, where, you know, I won't speak to them a certain way and they won't speak to me a certain way. And it's just the same with front and back house. Whereas I think maybe when I was in my early 20s, I, I think I would have accepted a lot more. Um, yeah, because you think it's normal. Yeah. You think it's okay oh this is how it is particularly when i first moved to london um yeah. there was uh you're like oh well this is london so you know this, this is what this is what you have to do as a chef it's a it's a rite of passage almost you have to get beasted by some head chef who's who's deeply insecure about his abilities and he's taking it out on his, his younger chefs or whatever yeah. that may be but 
I, I do think that uh, kitchen culture has improved massively. I'm sure it, I'm, there's many kitchens where it's still not right, but I just think young people now just won't tolerate it. They would just, I don't yeah, know. I think, I think it's important. So, yeah. I think you mentioned London, but I think that for 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 change to happen, it's it's important that it happens at the at the epicenter, you know. And I think it's important that, like, of course, like I'm out in Galway, and it's it's a great place to be. And but I think that when you want change to happen, you you need to be looking at capital cities, and you want the restaurants that are in London, in Dublin, in Paris, in Berlin, in New York. I mean, they're the ones you want to, for me anyway, to change, you know. And if you can change restaurants there, where it is extremely difficult, like the the odds are against you because there are more restaurants. It's harder. Like when you can change those kind of places, I think then that um, that then that change starts to filter through. And I think it's always very important. No more than going to London as a rite of passage to work and then come home or going to Copenhagen or or wherever you go. I think it's really important that you you try and uh, do that in in the the best way possible because it's. Um, it's uh i think that influences change in the small restaurants around the country because i think they're the ones that are have this certain uh mentality or or, or certain kind of um what they like call old school or whatever and it, for me it's just like how do you how do you progressively change that and and just make it make them make a, your um your working environment a better place to work and it is, like i think it's possible you know of course you're always going to be against the clock and there's always going to be pressure and there's always going to be difficulty between staff and 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 it's it's just trying to manage manage them and mind them and uh, yeah. and i think just i think also just trying to get the the people that you put in charge whether it's your sous chefs or your your restaurant managers or that to make sure that they they have that that same philosophy you know and it, there's no point in the owner having whatever philosophy he wants and then the whole place running whatever way it wants as well you know i think it's really important that the people that you put in in place your managers and that you, they have the same understanding that you go look this is the way we want to run the business and uh this is you have to buy into this this, this idea and I, I think that's for me that's sometimes the hardest thing particularly with around the kind of middle management where you have the sous chefs and they, they want to run the kitchen a certain way and you go like this is the way i want it run and it's um it's, it's sometimes it's I'd, I'd rather less results and happier happier chefs you know yeah, I, I completely hear you. It's you, you I, and I, I think a lot of the times when um, I'm, I've been guilty of it myself, but like that that sous chef who or whoever it might be, they they've seen something in somewhere else they've worked, and they think like, oh well, this is the way I have to run it because that's the way it was run there, and that's you know we all worked really hard there and it was right, but like well, it wasn't kind of right how how things were ran there. Um, what was I going to say? Um, no, it's gone. I had a point, but it's gone. Um, uh, no, no, no worries. At all. But I, I do find that sometimes when I went into like high performing places that 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 had a that a great philosophy, and then I think it all just went to pot the minute service started, and it just it ran the, the way everything ran. And so I, I think it's for, and personally, I think that's even I, I've seen that in my own places because we have three restaurants, we have forty five staff. I can't be everywhere, so I, I think the, the the longer I'm in it, the more I realise that like it's really important that the people you put in place to manage whatever areas you're going to manage, really that you you're able to sit down with them and go, look, this is the way I want things run. You know, it's it's uh, it's um, I want people to be happy, and it, and it might seem bizarre, but unfortunately, most people are not built like that. And, at the end of the day, if you if we have if you have an amazing sous chef that's come from uh, some place in France, they'll have a certain attitude towards. Look, it's yeah. irrelevant how you feel. The feelings are irrelevant. Like uh, it's it's the the goal is to produce something that gets on the plate and is eaten by the diner and they're happy. And I think trying to turn that around. Uh, and sometimes it's an uphill an uphill battle, you know, particularly when you're we're coming out of an institution that that doesn't want people to feel anything. It's like you just go to work and you do you perform this task irrespective of how you feel. And if, to be honest, I don't want to talk about how you feel or, or what what your day has been like. And I think trying to change that slightly, you know, is 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 important. I remember um, I, I worked for uh, Nuno Mendes for 
three or four years and he's kind of renowned as being just a really nice guy and I, I came from quite um quite a regimental kitchen and then went working for him and he's you know no one raises his voice he speaks to everyone with a, a very high level of respect which i was quite taken back by it at first i was like he's my boss why is he being so nice to me um but something he's he used to say about um another uh chef in london or who's who a bunch of restaurants who i won't name but he's he even said he didn't like eating in his restaurants because you can taste the hatred on the plate and I, I don't think if, 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 if staff are not happy, they cannot produce nice food. Maybe everything will be diced perfectly and look the same and very pretty, but you can taste the hatred on that plate. Because no one made it out of love. No one so tasting it. My brother has said the same thing. My brother is, uh, uh, no, I don't always agree with him, but he, he's into Eastern medicine. And he's, oh, he always says to me, you know, you can taste the anger. And I was like, you can't taste the fucking anger. And he's like, you can taste the anger. And, um, and he actually said to me, and he doesn't even eat out that much. He was like, I'm not going into this person's restaurant because I know they're angry and I'm not eating their angry food. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be bad for me. But I do, I do think that, uh, like even something as stupid as, and it sounds so, I think it's really important as an owner, as a chef owner, to go in and say hello to every single person, like including the kitchen porter. Because too often yes. when I worked, when I worked, uh, it's like as a chef de partie or a commie chef, like the head chef came in, said, talk to the sous chef and then left. And I don't think you can, I don't think you can gauge a kitchen from only talking to your head chef or your sous chef. I think it's really important to, to, to go in and uh, and chat to the kitchen porter and say how are things going is everything okay and because i mean it, it it's really important to have all the elements lining up together and that, to make sure i think that the kitchen porter or the new waiter or the, the bar manager are all just as happy as as the people that who are in charge because it's it's really important to to have buy-in for you to see for you to for the sous chefs and the head chefs to see that Look, if, if, if JP comes in, he's going to be talking to everyone. So I can't like just like abuse uh, X, Y, or Z because I, um, it, it, it will come out. And I think that's that's for me. What, that's one of the greatest learning curves I think over the last five years. Because I think at the beginning, when I got caught up in being a, a restaurateur and managing three restaurants, it was like just almost like no, just I leave it to the head chef or the sous chef and they'll be grand Whereas, and then stuff starts to fragment very quickly and then you find out people aren't happy and like because i suppose they, they come working for you and they and they want to see you yeah. you know and they want you want you to be there and even if it's just to uh, have a chat and have a coffee in the kitchen and like so i i think for me it's it's been a kind of humbling experience and and trying to make sure that i'm in um i mean i'm in the kitchens at least at least once a week to work to just to just to be be normal you know and just to go yeah look i'm just i could just chop just as just the same as you it's just a it's just a job i'm not in i'm not in some privileged area where uh just because i'm the i'm the owner of the restaurant you know and i think i think for me that that's quite a quite a humbling thing to do no well, definitely definitely I, I do think now guys. days as well oh sorry Hey, no, it's okay. You, um, I was just going to say that we have a couple of questions starting to come in from from the audience. But go ahead, Patrick, if you wanted to finish that. No, I, was, I was going to say, um, I think now it's it's also quite frowned upon industry wise to to not be nice in kitchens. Like, it, you know, certainly amongst my peers and friends, that you know, if, if we hear of someone who's not nice or is horrible to their staff or whatever, you know, they. We, we talk about them, we talk about how they're not nice and how that's not okay, as opposed to, you know, maybe 10 years ago, it might have been kind of cool to, oh, like, oh, yeah, this guy just be all his staff all day, he's a really good chef, and now you're like, he's horrible, don't go work for him. So it is, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely not cool anymore to be a dick in a kitchen, it's it's not, and there's still a few people that carry on with it, but, you know, they, they'll die out, they have to retire at some time. I think that I think that'd be a good uh, good slogan on a T-shirt. It's definitely not cool to be a dick anymore in the kitchen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that one. I'm gonna get that one made uh, because I do think uh, <laughs> it could be the next food in the edge T-shirt. Um, I'll, I'll write that down. I don't know if it'll pass. Uh, if it'll pass like the 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 committees and all that, but you never know. Ruth, what do you think of questions? 
Uh, no worries. Yeah, there's a couple of questions coming in, but just a couple of things that I wanted to, to ask you, you guys about as well. And um, yeah, that's interesting what you're saying, Patrick, about just the kind of change in attitude. And I think even a few years ago, you got a lot of that thing of, you know, what you were saying, like, oh, it's a rite of passage and a lot of chefs almost kind of going, well, this is what I went through. So this is what everyone needs to go through, kind of. And actually, even at Food on the Edge, there's like a generational shift. You know, there's some of the um, older chefs that you still kind of hear, hear saying that stuff or telling the stories about, you know, the kind of anecdotes of like how tough things were, but almost like as a badge of honour rather than, oh, this is what we need to to change. Um, but Patrick, I was wondering, like you did your talk at Food in the End of 2019, it was really striking, you know, talking about um, I suppose how being out of the kitchen affected you. And I'm just wondering, like, was it difficult to, to, to talk about that on the stage in front of all of those other chefs? Um, yeah, I, I don't think I realised how difficult it was until I stood up there and I, I'd never stood in front of as many people before and I never thought you'd be able to see everyone's individual face. I just thought it would all blur to one and then you've seen different very high profile chefs and journalists and then, then it felt difficult. Um, but it, it was difficult but um, the feedback afterwards was, you know, made it feel worthwhile. I did the immediate feedback, just, you know, walking out of there and having lots of people coming up and saying they could, they appreciated what I said or they, um, that it resonated with them. Um, and it kind of, it made me wish that I kind of opened up a bit more and spoke about it at length a bit more as well. Um, but no, it was, it was, I didn't think it was difficult till I was standing in front of everyone and sweating. <laughs> and I'd like JP, you spoke in, in the blog that you wrote for Chef Network about how you know, convers like conversations around mental health just didn't really happen in the past and it was something that was very hidden. And this was when, do you think that's something that really tangibly has changed in the industry and that people openly have these conversations? And I suppose, when did you see things start to change? Like, I, I think it's changing. Like, I think it would be naive to say it has changed. I think that, uh, as Pat was saying, like, there are still kitchens where it's it, you, you will find uh it, it, it is possible to talk in, in kitchens where it's not i think as a society we're probably better uh talking about it now um than we were i still think we we could be better i don't know how that how that better what that betterness would look like because i know myself sometimes i don't want to talk about it because i just don't want i don't want it to be the focus and you just want when you want to go to work or you want to do something um because i think as a society dealing with emotions it is something that you have to, I suppose, sit down and, and talk about. And I think sometimes it's better to do it outside the the kitchen. And sometimes it's like when you can meet, just making sure that you uh, you meet your staff um, before work for a coffee or uh, just checking in, checking in with them or or uh, or after work, and um, and just making sure that that they understand uh, that the, 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 these are places where. You don't have to just go into your section and feel that no one's going to talk to you for 12 hours and if you are having some issues and that so i think the kind of bringing humanity into the into the kitchens is uh is 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 is, is really is really important but it's certainly a million a million miles away from where it was when uh say when i was working in the 90s uh, in the mid 90s where it just it's just where you just literally where I suppose you were supposed you were seen as something that was well, uh, as a thing that wasn't meant to feel. I mean, chefs were just, and maybe that's where all the anger came from. Like it was just like you were to produce a product, and that product was to go out into the dining room, and it was like it, it was irrelevant how good of a, a bad or a day or what happened. It was just like this, but this had to be done. And I think it's important to try and step back and and and, uh, and just reflect about how how we are just uh, emotional beings, and I think that it's uh, we need to try and bring that in. Not to the detriment of the industry, but just that that it's balanced, you know. Mm. A really interesting question here, actually, from an, uh, an audience member, which kind of com relates back to some of the things you were speaking about earlier. Um, Patrick, I might ask you this one. Um, someone asked, how do you deal with working for a really good chef that is abusive? And then follows on to say it's a bad to walk out of an abusive kitchen. And I think that there is like, you know, there's that kind of dichotomy of you know the chefs who are really at the considered to be at the top of their game because they're like super talented maybe they've Michelin stars you know what they're talked about in the media etc but then the reality might be in the background a lot of people in the industry know that they 
don't treat the staff well and I suppose what advice would you give on that to to maybe younger chefs I think, and people who are working through their careers and trying to get experience I think like it's, it's reflecting back on it now I'd say just you know get out of there but um but it, when you're in that situation it's a lot more difficult because you know it might be um it might impress people to say you work at that restaurant and maybe you are learning a lot but if, if you're being treated unfairly or you know being abused physically or mentally then one should just walk because there's plenty of good restaurants you know and there's not there's not there's not one place where you're just going to learn one thing there's there's hundreds there's thousands of other places you can go to work where you can be treated properly and learn as much i don't think it's i don't think it's like a fair trade-off that you know you learn x amount here but we'll treat you like a dog i don't think it has to be like that anymore because it's not that it's just you know there's not um four great restaurants in dublin there's there's 20 now you know it's 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 you don't have to put up with it it's not and i think like stockholm syndrome can play a big part in kitchens and i think a lot of chefs particularly of an older generation feed off that as well because they know that if if they treat you like shit and convince you that you have to stay there because you won't learn as good anywhere else or no one else is cooking as good as they are um it's it's a very dangerous thing in a very selfish way for those chefs to behave and uh, i do believe that these things are always born in insecurity um but no my advice would be to uh, to leave it and, and go somewhere else where you get treated nice and you can learn because you, you can have both you don't you don't have to put up with it absolutely um so it might come to you on this one jp it's a nice comment and, and question from someone in the audience saying i feel it's um it's very nature of chefs that they're hardwired to after people to to feed off each other people's enjoyment and satisfaction and then having that ripped away from you leaves a big big hole um that you're left to fill um and then also kind of you're left looking inside yourself which can be difficult and terrifying um and this this chef saying she's um a ball of fear, fear in her stomach this time around more than previous lockdowns um but that she's really trying to feed it by actually looking at food which is her job and how she can use that as a survival tool uh tapping into the knowledge of uh, her power of food um and she's just wondering, have you ever turned to, to food as something that you help uh, use, you know, to help melt mental anxieties and, you know, look at the types of food that you eat and how that helps you in terms of your gut and, and, um, and you know, the, the kind of um, mental connection between what, what we eat and um, our minds, I suppose, which actually we're going to have later on in the month, we're going to have a, a panel discussion specifically on that topic. But is that something that you look at or consider no de definitely i mean i i do think like and it, it's like a cliche to say you are what you eat but i i think that um uh, like their gut health and and um uh and eating i think wholes wholesomely is uh is is important and i i think that particularly that we have time it doesn't i i i disagree to say that it always has to be something healthy if, 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 if for want of a better word i think that being able to create food is is a beautiful thing, and um, I think certainly at the moment, with with so many days ahead of me, I just like to plan a few a few projects, and whether that's making sourdough or we made some um, profiteroles with the, with the kids uh, as a as something just to keep as to keep active, and then to actually enjoy it, do you know. And I think that that process of of making. I think is really is 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 really important. But certainly, I think that around the the gut health, I think it's it's really important to to keep a, to keep an eye on 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 eating well, and um and making sure that you're drinking enough water and on all that all these things that sometimes I just completely I just completely forget. But I do think it makes you it makes you feel better, and I think that 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 in turn affects uh, how you how I suppose how you think about yourself. Mm. Patrick, do you think that chefs sometimes um, neglect the, the actual pleasure and enjoyment of food? Is it something that some gets forgotten a little bit when you're actually working in the kitchen? And is that something you've had, you've been able to kind of revisit during the lockdown? I think uh, I, I have been eating um, quite well on lockdowns, which is maybe a, a little bit too well, particularly during the summer. I've, I've, I've been um, behaving myself a bit more this time around. Um, but I, well, I think again, 
going back to to being younger in kitchens that you know you'd go a whole day without easing or someone might get to run out and get a few cans of coke and some mars bars and that would be your your dinner and you'd be very grateful that you got that um but now you know, I, I, I have to eat i have to have breakfast i have to have a, a meal during the day or i'm, I'm, fl I'm fl flailing come service i can't i can't get through it and we always kind of make a point of um cooking nice that food in the kitchen we, we've breakfast and we have dinner be it it might just be uh porridge or something in the morning uh something very basic but then come uh come dinner time we always we take turns cooking something nice we always you know we preempt it as well we talk about it um and we cook it for ourselves and front of house and you know it's always kind of a thing where you know if you're not going to cook nice food for your colleagues you're not going to cook nice food for your guests because you should care more about the people you work with than anyone else. Um, so we always make a, a thing of it. If you know it's it's important to uh, to eat something proper. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, we're coming towards towards the end of of the hour. There's only about five minutes left, and I know Rebecca needs to to, to come in at the end as well to 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 wrap up. But um, I so we. What a question from an audience member, and then I'll give you another question at the at the same time. So, um, some of the audience asking, do either of you find yourself suffering from anxiety about returning to work after being out of the kitchen for so long? Um, and along with that, I'm just wondering, is there are there a couple of things in particular that you have found have really helped you? Just I suppose tools that you have used, um, whether it's around exercise or or other things that have really kind of helped you, I suppose, in times that you've really been struggling or things that you just do on a regular basis to, to kind of stay well and mind your mind. And I suppose what advice maybe you'd give to other chefs or your own teams. Um, so maybe we'll start with you, Patrick, and then wrap up with you, JP. Um, well, it's the first, like definitely feeling anxious about going back in. Um, you know, uh, has your body gotten too used to to sitting down and, you know, can can you still stand up for? For 14 15 hours a day um can you can you still fill the fish properly um is your mind going to take over the same way in terms of food and then also will you be busy um will people come out to eat will will uh will the staff you had still want to come work for you when this is over will they uh move on to to other places as, as jp mentioned earlier um so yeah there's, there's a lot of anxiety around every closure and and reopening um and then in terms of tools to help um I, I i like walking i just go for very long walks i listen to a lot of podcasts um we got we got a dog on in october who's been such a such a blessing it's something we've been talking about for a long time and i get now my partner's working from home so allowed us to be able to get one but that dog gets walked a lot goes on some very very long walks <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Patrick. What about you, JP? Yeah, I think uh, we got a dog as well, so definitely uh, that helps. <laughs> and it was also, I've, I've been thinking, I've been thinking about it for ten years. Will I get a dog or not? And um, they're uh, they're certainly something you just uh, that need to be walked. So that that's that's really helpful. I think I think trying to as as chefs uh, like chefs, I mean, love food, and food is connected to so many different things. Whether it's art or photography or like listening to podcasts about food in, in its in in terms of where uh, different chefs speaking so i think trying to keep trying to diversify and trying to sit down and think about like what does food mean to me because like there are there are many other things that that people that we can be doing you know and i think that i mean no chef is just just a person that goes in and cooks food and so i think that trying to keep active and I, I, as, as Patrick mentioned, podcasts. I think that podcasts or audio books, I think, are a really good thing for me, because you can go for a walk and then listen to something, and then you can also just keep, uh, I, for me, just keep edu keep educating yourself um, on um, on different things. And I think that's for me that that that's important for my own uh, my own mental health. Good stuff. Okay, I think we're we're just about out of time. So. Um... Thanks so much, guys, for a really, really interesting conversation. Um, and I think Re Rebecca's going to take over and wrap up. So thanks a million, Patrick and JP. No worries. Thank you. Very thanks much. so much.
Thanks, Ruth. And thank you to JP and Patrick for taking part in this event today and for providing us with such an open and honest view into their experiences um, on mental health. Um, thank you to you, our audience, uh, for joining today's session. And we hope that you found this session uh, insightful, inspiring and valuable for your own mental health. We do have another three upcoming sessions uh, in our Mind Your Mind campaign over the next three weeks, which you should be able to see on your screens now. Each of these events are open for registrations at the moment, and we encourage you to do so on the Chef Network website, which is chefnetwork.ie. Thank you again from all the team of Chef Network and uh, our Mind Your Mind partners, BWG Food Service. Thanks everybody and have a great day.